Good morning, beloved. Glad to see you all here. Man, it is a chilly. It's always a little bit colder in the shop here on Friday mornings. Uh, Mr. Jiraiya, who is, uh, works for me, my personal assistant, uh, he has Fridays off. So it's up to me to start my fire, and I didn't get it going quite as early as he does in the morning. So that'll keep us frosty, uh, cold and frosty this morning. Speaking of cold and frosty, today was number six of my three-minute cold shower with the Win Hof breathing method. And man, I cannot tell you how wonderful it is. I was speaking with, uh, I've been hearing back from some of you guys that have been doing it along with me. I am on day six. It's getting easier and easier. And actually the last couple days, I've been um, wanting to go a little bit, even go a little bit longer. And some of you have been telling me that you've been doing it twice a day and having uh, some really amazing benefits from it. It's such a simple thing, but of course, the, thing of, the things of the Lord always are. It's men that make, uh, make the world complicated and uh, a lot of hoops to have to jump through. Everything that comes from him is always simple and we shouldn't be surprised. Now, one interesting thing when I was, uh, when we were starting this, we're on day five of the live stream when I've actually, you know, been doing this in earnest. How's the audio, by the way? Give me ones if the audio is good. I got my, I'll take my blanket off here in, the minute, in a minute. It's getting cold out here. Uh, the idea was I resurrected the Wrangler Star 2 channel and, and what I was thinking was I would dump all of the live streams over there, the high quality versions, and leave the, <clears throat> the main channel for what we've always done, and maybe put some clips on there. But I'll tell you, something strange has happened. Uh, I am not new to uploading video content on YouTube, as I've been doing it for 13 years. Uh, I have it figured out, I get it, I know how to do it, I do it every day. And for some reason, I could not get that content to load up there it would drop, it would stop working, I was refreshing over and over again, and it, maybe it dawned on me, I don't know that I'm supposed to be putting it over there, so it's going to stay over here. <laughs> it seems to upload just fine, so is that a message from God telling me that uh, we need to keep, keep everything in one spot? I think so, I think so. Audio looks good. How many of you, now, now tell, be honest here, of course, we're professional homeowners, they live by the golden rule. Do unto others as you do unto, uh, unto, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Honest, good, straightforward people. Are you doing, are you taking your cold showers? Are you doing it? Are you following the Win Hof um, along with me, uh, the method? Let me know sevens in the chat. I want to know uh, if you're suffering as much as I am. And actually, the suffering is not all that great. It's actually getting better. This morning, I told you yesterday, um, I, didn't, uh, I didn't have the, the terrible dread. This morning, day five, day six, I actually kind of look forward to it. Instead of have to, do, you know, I, funny, I, I was hearing back, people were telling me all the different things, how the little mind tricks they have to play to jump into that cold shower. And if you're just joining us, this is a way uh, to really get your, your, your day started. There's a lot of health benefits to it. The energy that comes through it is incredible. I, Mrs. W and I, and I'm excited to see if I can get her involved in this. Th this last you know, year or so, you know, going through Corona and all that, one thing that we've always been saying is towards the evening is, man, I'm just so tired and I, you know, don't, don't feel good. Just don't, don't have the energy that I once had. And it was kind of a, a, it was kind of a slow roll to get here. And, and in, in a matter of six days, I feel like I'm, I'm 20 years younger. I have um, so much more energy. Uh, I, I, I can uh, stay warmer outside. I just feel younger and feel better. So of course, this is anecdotal. Uh, your mileage may vary, but I just don't see a downside to it. So jump in there, get along with this. I'm gonna be doing it every day. We'll be documenting it. And I wanna see, give me sevens. Give me sevens if you are doing it with me. I'm convinced that this is, is definitely the way to go. Goodness, we're starting off early. We have a super chat from our friend Zacchaeus Nifong. Shout out to you. Is it Zacchaeus? Zacchaeus, just like from the, the Bible. Do you know who Zacchaeus was? Zacchaeus was a wee little man. The Bible, uh, in the New Testament, Jesus tells the story. He was, a, I believe he was a, a publican or a tax collector. And he was so excited to see the Lord when he came through in his ministry. And he couldn't get through the crowds. And, and everyone probably hated him and disrespected him and reviled him, you know, because of his occupation. He climbed up in a tree so that he could look down and see his Lord. And, of course, we know the story. When our Lord walked by, he said, Zacchaeus, come down out of that tree. Uh, I'll be having supper with you tonight. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? But 
That's the way our Lord was. He was a rebel. His prophets were rebels, in and out of prison, in and out of jail. We have this idea, whoops, <laughs> we have this idea, uh, we've been lied to by the Western Christ church that uh, uh, men of God are uh, weak, timid, uh, revilable, disgusting, hateful creatures uh, that, that don't do anything, when that is not the truth. The prophets that God sent were powerful men to be feared. You know, funny story in the Old Testament when we read the prophet the prophets sometimes would go from town to town by themselves, and they were highly re re regarded, and they were also uh, uh, feared. <laughs> There's one story where uh, when the, the, the men of the town saw the prophet coming through, uh, they all gathered together, and they went out there with their hats in their hand, and they said, uh, Sir, are you here for good or for evil? Because <laughs> you know, they didn't know it. Even though he was one man, uh, such esteem and such power men of God had in those days uh, that they were terribly feared. Um, and I think that the prophets of God, um, that he's going to send them. You know, God says that I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. I changeth not. So it's good to know those old stories. Mama, you have a role to play in the show. Back up here on your blanket. The prophets of God uh, are going to come from places that we didn't expect uh, and quarters that we didn't expect. And they were, um, before God does something major, before he ever does a, a huge move, he doesn't spring it upon people. He sends his prophets to warn his people. Now, we have the story of, of the children of Israel where they oftentimes they did not receive him. Sometimes they did, sometimes they didn't. You know, the Old Testament, the old book is just that ebb and flow of people falling in and out, falling in and out, and they would even kill and murder the prophets. But uh, very interesting. So don't look, not that it can't happen, but don't look for religious leaders, uh, and I don't know how important religious leaders are in this day and time, but don't look for men of God to come from the avenues that you think. They may show up with tattoos, they may show up um, ex-cons, felons, that is typically, in my experience, the best folks I've actually met. We've been trained by society to look upon evil. Uh, evil has a certain look. You know, it's, it's scraggly, and maybe it's got tattoos, muscles, muscles, you know, riding on motorcycles. You know, we're taught from an early age that these people are scary. These people are dangerous. And a person that's well-groomed and in a suit and respectable with uh, degrees and education, that that person couldn't be bad, and of course he is good. But as we know, those of us that have been down in the dirt and amongst those sort of people, the most generous people you'll ever meet in your life are always the ones that have the little, the least. The, ones that, the one that will give his shirt off of his back for you uh, will give you the only shirt that he has. And it's those that sit in the ivory towers that have, have so much rarely uh, are, are people like that. So God, you know, God tells us to be look, tells us that, you know, one thing that comes, and it, let's get started. I lost my train of thought here. I just get so excited, you know how it is. Glad to be here, and thank you, uh, Zacchaeus. So Zacchaeus writes, uh, doing some strategy work in the office overlooking the southwest desert from 16 stories up while doing Mr. Dad's Live. Uh, just good old conversation. Well, I appreciate that, and this is a great medium. It's fun. I love the live stream. I really appreciate you guys hanging out with me, and it's fantastic. So I was working this morning. I put up a couple clips last night on the main channel. I will just go ahead and we'll just let these videos go right on there. So if you miss them, the live streams, they will be on the main page under that tab that says live stream. So we'll just not mess with it. If this is the way the Lord wants it to happen, then who am I uh, to argue with him? But thank you, Zacchaeus. I appreciate it. And uh, get back to work. We have a super chat from Mr. Dean Pickett and double alternator member. Shout out to you, Dean, and thank you for your generosity. Dean writes, I have been taking cold showers for years it quickly got to the point where I could, couldn't start the day without it to get my mind right. You know, I'm not surprised at that at, at all. Uh, being a new convert, you know, I'm going to be insufferable for the next couple of weeks because that's always, new converts to anything are always the most insufferable because they, they, they're excited about this and they found something new and they want to share it with everyone and people like yourself like, oh yeah, we've been doing this a long time, you know, well, welcome to the club. But you just have to, have to tolerate me. Enthusiasm breeds enthusiasm, and if I've received benefits, I know you've received benefits as well, because this here, 
We're building an army, a spiritual army of God right here. A lot of you are going to be called out to do great work, and we need to encourage one another. And if this is something that can help you jumpstart your day and, good at, and get a good mindset and have a healthier body, then, then I, I, I'm, I'm a supporter of it. You know, the other interesting thing that comes from it, I have been always uh, ate a lot of junk food and been very particular, and I don't like vegetables. <laughs> you know, I I've eaten, you know, I've not had a good diet. I've been blessed with good genetics, so it hasn't really crept up on me or been a problem to this point. But the one thing that's so interesting is when you open your heart to the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, when God starts to come into you, it's amazing the old bad habits that start to fall off of you. And even you just sometimes you'll just wake up and realize, you know what? I didn't realize it, but I haven't. Something that was, a, was difficult for me, uh, having a sweet tooth and, and wanting to have ice cream and cookies and candy and, and the sweets after every meal was something, it was, the, the power was so strong that I found it irresistible, even to the point where I have been known, if I didn't have sweets in the house, to get in the car after supper and drive there and go get something. You know, that's how insatiable my appetite was. Realized this last couple days, I, last night actually, I was having dinner with my, supper with my sister before she heads back down to California, and she asked me about diet, and it kind of dawned on me, like, I, I just dawned on me that, that that desire that I've always had my entire life has kind of fallen off. So it's really an incredible thing what God will do and how all these habits, even things that you may be doing that you don't understand, may be destroying you or destroying your health or, or ruining the ability of you to have a direct connection with your, with your father, is um, he'll shed those things. He'll fall off. You know, C.S. Lewis, one of my favorite authors, he was a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant man. Two books that you should read right away is A Mere Christianity and the Screwtape Letters uh, by C.S. Lewis. In one of those books, he makes an analogy of, of uh, when he was a child, uh, his mother taking him to the dentist. And he says, you know, I hated the dentist with a passion. I was absolutely terrified of the dentist. And I knew that when I started to have a toothache, I would hide it from my mother. Because once I told her, she wouldn't be content with that. She would take me to the dentist, and that dentist would start poking around and finding other things that I, did, that I didn't even know were bad, and my whole, it was just going to, to be a terrible experience. You know, I wanted the one tooth fixed, but he wouldn't stop at that. He would, wouldn't stop until he fixed everything, and he didn't like that. So he would put it off and put it off. And that's really a good analogy. You know, we, sometimes we'll have a particular habit, or we have a vice. You know, it could be you're drinking too much, it could be pornography, it could be whatever, gambling, pick your poison, doesn't matter. We all, we all suffer under these different things. You know, one man gets mastery over something that's easy, that's never a temptation for him, and the other, it will just ruin his life forever. But sometimes we'll have one of those things, or a particular little pet sin that, that we're having trouble with, it's, it's starting to degrade our life, and we'll, we'll get down and we'll very sincerely take that uh, to the Lord and, and say, oh, if you could just deliver me from this horrible, whatever, horrible thing, I, I would be so much happier. And what you'll find, as C.S. Lewis puts it, he won't be content with that. He'll come in and take that. But if you imagine the temple or this vessel that we've been given as a house, you know, and Jesus as a carpenter, he'll come in and uh, you've got a leaky roof that you're complaining about and you're asking him to fix it. He, he won't be content with that. He'll fix that leaky roof, but he'll fix it by tearing off the whole roof. And in that tearing down process, sometimes we'll be thinking, oh, this is more than I asked for. This is, I did not want this. I just wanted my leaky roof fixed. What we don't realize, there are a lot of things in our life that are holding us back and preventing us from, from achieving what we want to achieve and being the man that God wants us to be. And that, just, just, that remodel process can be very difficult. He's knocking walls out. He's tearing off roofs. He's, he's tearing out plumbing. And all we can see is the wreckage. It's like he's destroying me. You know, he's going to completely ruin me. What you don't realize is that he wants to take that shabby little shack that you've become with a leaky roof, and he wants to build it into a mansion or a palace. So you just got to stand by and let it happen. Trust that he knows what, what we need it before we even ask, and we'll be in that, that's the way you want to do it. Uh, so you have to, to, you've got to break a few eggs before you can make that omelet. But thank you for that super chat, Mr. Pickett. Mr. Pickett's ahead of us here. Uh, we all have another super chat from Dean Pickett who writes, thank you for your talk on prawn. I had my son watch it as I felt it was very important. Yeah, you know, it's something that all of us struggle with. And, and the people, the men that don't struggle with it um, are most likely lying about it. 
but I don't think it's anything to be ashamed of. We need to get these things out in the open. We need to face them. We need to stop pretending they're not a problem. If you've struggled with it and, and you just think, oh, you know, and, and you've fallen in and out of it, fallen in and out of it year after year after year, you get to the point where you just get so discouraged, you just stop trying. Well, that's going to happen. You cannot do it on your own. You really need to help. You need some help, and God will help you with that. Um, but yeah, there, we don't have anything to be ashamed of, brother. Get, it, get everything out, in, brothers. Get out in the open. Let's face it. Let's deal with it. And I know personally, I draw tremendous encouragement knowing that I'm not the only one struggling from these things, that you too are also doing this. These are common things to man, and God understands this. He's not act, asking us to be saints. He's just asking us to trust him. We have a super chat from Brave Sig 8. Shout out to you and single alternator member. He writes, hey, Cody, this is Brady from Thunder Ranch. I loved your kind words towards the Smiths yesterday. It's awesome where you've taken your channel. God bless. Maybe I'll see you again one day. Oh, Brady's a good dude. I, Mrs. W and I have had such a wonderful experience every time we've went there and just met the best people I've, the, the best, best people I've ever met in my life. If you guys want tier one, best of the best, proper firearms training, no BS, no, no flashy stuff, just what, what works, just common knowledge and a, and a lifetime of experience. You know, Clinton, Heidi Smith are, are the people. They have a first, first class facility. I've been to a lot of shooting ranges and the first thing you're met with a lot of those is garbage. Targets on the ground, busted up pieces of plywood, holes in doors, holes in things. You know, it just looks kind of shabby and just trashy. You just think of white trash when you see them. Uh, not so at, at Clinton Heidi's place. Everything is immaculate. Actually, when I first rolled up there and saw the facility, and it started at the very beginning with the covered bridge and, and going up through the beautiful ponderosa pine trees and the state of everything, the condition of the roads, absolutely immaculate. Everything was immaculate. And I even had some folks tell me that if someone makes a goof and accidentally shoots a hole in something in a sign or something that they weren't supposed to be shooting at, uh, I've heard that that will be dealt with and you won't even see it the next day. It will be taken care of. And that is, that, that, is, that is a powerful testimony of the gospel right there. You know, an interesting thing, being slovenly and not taking care of the things that you've been given, not taking care of the car. And it doesn't matter if you have an old beater, if you're driving a hoopty or you're driving a brand new truck, it doesn't make any difference. You need to be taking care of things and you need, to, you need to everything to be neat and tidy. And I don't care, it's not about quantity, but lead by example. Just driving up there, you know, you can just tell that these people are godly people just from the way that they conduct themselves. It's obvious when you look at it. It does a great service to God, disservice to God if his people or his followers are not neat and tidy and orderly. It starts right there. It may seem like a simple thing, but, it is, but, but it's an important thing. When I, I, I've been talking for years about trying to get a hold of clutter and, and how frustrating that's been to me. I mean, it's just consumed me. I, I realize now that God's been moving me to do this, that this is something that I needed to have because my mind is, gets out of order if I'm in a disorderly, organiz, uh, disorderly shop. Started with my closet. My closet is perfect. Every sock is perfect. Every shirt is folded. I don't throw things on the ground anymore. I don't throw things on the bed. I don't, I don't, I don't do anything until it's put away. A place for everything and everything has a place. And when you go into that environment in the morning, you have a, a calmness and it settles you. And you enjoy the whole experience. You know, before I'd be rushing around and picking stuff off the ground and trying to hide something under the bed. Not anymore. I take my time. I'm in the moment. I, I stop my brain from thinking all the time and worrying about everything. No, it's just very calming and very orderly. And it just makes your day excellent. It's fun to take. It's, it's a lot nicer to get dressed and to get yourself ready when you can take something that's been nicely folded and, and, and put it on. It's not wrinkled and it's not dirty. And if you, if you need to grab something or you're in a hurry and you need your vest or you need your hat, you know, you don't have the frustration of running around looking for it, not being able to find it, etc. It's just, it's the way to go. Uh, if we look at the Old Testament, there's a precedent for this too. The Old Testament, 
God gave very specific instructions when the children of Israel, when they came, came out of Egypt, how they were to set up their camp. It was very neat and it was very orderly. You know, some people might say OCD, whatever, you know, whatever that means. He did that for a purpose. There's, there's something behind it. He was trying to teach a people something. They were coming out of an, a horrible environment, 400 years of slavery, oppression. Just, just, you can imagine the squalor and the filth that they must have lived in. They didn't even know how to live. You know, they didn't, they, they had been, didn't have access to education for all that time. They were mistreated. You know, you can just state of those people. There was a lot of training that needed to be involved with that, and that's why he did that. That's where they started. He started them by, by having neat and orderly camps, everything laid out on squares, everything laid out on grids for a reason. You know, it just calms the mind. It, it's, the, it's the way you want to be, and I would encourage you to do it. If your house or your apartment or your car and everything is in chaos, sometimes you can look at that stuff and you get overwhelmed. And you think, goodness, you know, I don't even know where to start, so I'm not going to. So I'm going to uh, uh, go to sit down here and play video games and just pretend that none of it happens and check out, right? Just start with your closet. Start with your clothing. Get everything out. Make an inventory. If there are things that you have that you are not wearing, get rid of them. Give them away. Take them to, to the thrift store. Sell them on eBay. Buy the things that you want. Have a simple wardrobe. Have high-quality items that will last, that you enjoy wearing, uh, that you look good in. You, when you look good, you feel good, and start with that. Your know, closets are small. On a half a day, weekend, whatever, you can have all that pulled out, everything done right, and just get in the habit of being neat and orderly, and that's really where you start. And then extend that to your vehicle, and then extend that to your garage, and just work away at it. You know, it's like eating an elephant, as my dad said, one piece at a time. When we started our homestead, the, the, the last homestead, we wanted to clear the forest, and it was in such terrible chaos because of the loggers that went through and just raped the land. It, we were, I was overwhelmed and I'd just go out there and just feel depressed because I'm like, there's just no point. I don't have any equipment. I don't have any tractors. There's no way I can even make a bit of difference. And as I've said before, I started with a 10 by 10 square. I thought, well, we'll clear a 10 by 10 square. That's what I can do. And that turned into a 100 by 100. And that turned into a 1,000 by 1,000. And before we knew it, we had a beautiful forest. And that's the way that it works. You just have to, perseverance is the key. People that are, my, my successes in life have not been a direct result of a particular uh, intellect or talent, to be honest with you. Just a bull-headed doggedness and persistence. I out, when we started, I started my eBay business, or my eBay by YouTube channel. There were channels that were so big and, you know, like nothing fancy. It was one of the bigger channels at the time. And I had this little tiny channel. And I just thought, oh, man, I just don't know how I could ever attain that. You know, that was just so far beyond, it, so, so far in the stratosphere that I couldn't even relate to it. But perseverance. And now I've exceeded those channels, not because of a particular gift, but just because I just didn't give up because I just kept hammering, kept hammering. My mantra was just keep on uploading. Just keep uploading. I don't care if what you're putting up is trash, whatever. Just keep uploading. Just keep doing it. Just keep doing it. One step, one step, one step. That's the way it works, gentlemen. Just go talk to or listen to anyone that has went through really difficult military training, like Navy SEALs or, or the Air Force PJs or Ranger School and stuff, and they'll tell you the same thing. They say, if you look into the future and you realize how much you have to go through, you become so depressed that you feel like giving up. The guys that I've listened to and talked to, they just said, I just lived minute by minute. I just put one foot in front of the other and I just knew that it had to end at some time. And that's the way you are right now. If you're suffering with depression, if you're not, things are not going the way you want it, just start moving forward. Just focus on what you can do. Be as good as you can do. Do all things to the glory of God and the things will work itself out. It's, you don't have to come, be clever. You don't have to be brilliant. You just have to not stop. That, that's all there is to it. Goodness, we have a super chat. Thank you, Brave Sig number eight. I really appreciate that. Very generous of you. We have a super chat from 1990 Trade Co. Thank you. Shout out to you. Thank you for your generosity. 1990 Trade Co. again. Shout out to you again. He says, how do I get over wanting to do everything on my own, just tuning in? Everything on my own. Yeah, I get that, man. I, I, um, 
I've, you know, I'll, I'll, to be honest with you, I've struggled with that particular thing with my, with my son. Uh, when I was teaching him how to do things, I, I, I would get so spun up about getting stuff done. You know, I grew up with my dad working construction, you know, ha him having a construction company, and we worked. My dad taught me how to work. You know, he taught me how to be efficient, and every, we were working all the time. And that was, I, I didn't know any different. And, and, and so for my mindset, whatever it was, it, it could be, out here washing motorcycles, it could be changing oil on something. I was so game on and everything had to be time is money, time is money, time is money. And I would find that when I was trying to teach Jack different things, that his, him not understanding it and, and asking questions and how and I realized how much this was slowing me down compared to what I could do myself, the urge was, you know what, just go in the house with your mother, I'll just do it myself. And I know that there's a lot of men that can relate to that and to how hard it is to be patient with your son. And that's one of the worst, most destructive things you can do. The reason why I guess I felt that way is because I just had that fear mentality or that mentality that time is money, time is money, and we have to be maximized and have to be as efficient as possible, that I'm just not, I have no other value on this planet than to be a worker bee. The good thing about the great reset that we're going through and the whole COVID thing is a lot of us are waking up. And I think this is God pouring out his spirit, pouring out insight to us to realize that there's more to life than just accomplishing tasks, to just get things done. My, 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 my perspective on this has changed 180 degrees. And I, I've been thinking actually a lot this week. There, there are people in my life that have not achieved the what what most people would say would be the success um, of houses, cars, and all that. That, Because you know, I, I grew up thinking that that's what success was, that that's what happiness was. And I, and I would, we, we always maintained friendships with these and a lot of these people, and a lot of these people were, were creative people and just people that just didn't fit into the normal society and, and they kind of lived on the fringes. And we'd get invited over to their house and you know, the, everything wasn't super nice and it wasn't, you know, there was, clutter and, and musical instruments all over the place. And I used to think, goodness, you know, look at all this trash around here. Look at all this, you know, look, look what's going on. But what I realize now is that those people were so much more advanced than I was. They realized that there was more to life than just being a worker drone. That it was important to enjoy sitting with your children, to, to, to sit down and to learn an instrument, even at the expense of maybe not making as much money. Maybe it's more important than painting your house um, in the summer to go and sit by the river and skip rocks with your kids. You know, they understood these type of things. And I burned through a lot of those younger years when Jack was little on that, with that grind mindset. And, and I guess, I don't know if this really pertains to your question, but I think that it does. I think a guy needs to realize that, you know, it just doesn't really matter. All those things that were so important to me back in the day that I just, I had to put off playing with my son or I wouldn't call him out to involve him with it because I didn't want to deal with the inefficiency. I wanted to be very productive and I want and time was money were, to, were tremendous losses. And now I missed out on those opportunities to bond with my son in those particular situations. And I'm not saying that I, I didn't fail all the time, but there were, there, I could have had a lot more moments where now looking back on it, I don't even remember what was so important at the time. It didn't, doesn't make any difference. It would have been a lot better to have realized that the time would have been better spent even if it took three days instead of two hours to do it with my son because we would have made, made memories and I wouldn't have, um, I would have just enjoyed the experience. So I guess what you need to realize is that there's more to life than just accomplishing things and making money and getting projects done. Yes, we have to do things, but let's, Let's keep it in perspective. I, I think having that mindset will definitely help. It, it's definitely helped me. I'm, I'm just coming around to it. We have a super chat from Garen Pele. Shout out to you, Garen. Is it Garen? Garan, Garen? He says, the world needs more people like you. Now more than ever, I very much appreciate what you teach and what you preach. Keep up the great work. Well, I'm not here. I can't, I'm not here to be an example to you. I suffer from the same problems as you guys do and, and more. I'm only here to point you to the one that 
that, it, that is it, the example, and that's Christ. Uh, that, that's the only thing that, we, that I can do here. So anything that I have to share from you here today or, or, uh, is just a direct result from that. I know my nature, and I know what I devolve into when I'm separated from God, when I'm far from God, and I can turn into a horrible person, very egotistical, very selfish, um, uh, very self-centered, narcissistic. Those are my tendencies to go to. Judgmental, judgmental, judgmental. That's the biggest thing that I suffer from, judgmental. And I came from a very judgmental family. That was, there was always, you know, you know the, that, that was always, you're talking about other people. And I just didn't know any different. And I didn't, didn't even realize how, how bad I suffered from that until God started to show me. How, how, I, how I judge people at face value and, and see things and make it opinions when I don't have any idea what's going on. And that is a terrible cross that I must bear that I have to deal with tremendously. You know, that, that's my number one thing is stop being judgmental. You don't know what's going on just by looking at someone from the outside. You don't know their struggles. You don't know what, what, what is happening. Being judgmental and gossiping about people is one of the worst traits a person could, could, can have. One of the things that I, I look back on now and I admired the most about my grandfather, my grandfather was the best man I ever met. He had no vices, not that I knew of. Uh, and I never, ever heard him once say anything bad about another man. And I spent a lot of time with him. And that's extraordinary when you think about it. And he was... I mean, I, I've thought back, and I thought back, and, and I and I just I, I don't ever ever remember him saying anything bad about another man. I saw his demeanor change around people that obviously that that he didn't like or had wronged him. I, I don't know the details. You know, I could see him. He just wasn't as as engaging. He wasn't as warm. But nothing you could ever hang your hat on. Um, being judgmental is very, very destructive to, to us and very destructive to, to relationship. And it's, one of the, it's, a, it's a great, great sin. Something we need, to, we need to get a handle on. We don't need to be judging anyone. Thank you, Garan. I sure appreciate your generosity. We have a super chat from Standard Land and Double Alternator member. Shout out to you. I'm hoping tomorrow, I, I, I'll plan, I'll commit to it right now. I don't think... I'm going to do a live stream for you members tomorrow. We'll do a Sabbath live stream. It's probably going to be around 10 o'clock or so. I'll post it up um, on the community page, the time. I'll, I'll, i got to look at my schedule, check and see. I've got the sweet loaf tomorrow, um, but we'll do that. We'll do that for an hour. So I'm guessing probably tomorrow morning we'll do a Sabbath stream. We'll hang out. We'll be in the house. We'll get a good fire going, and this will be just for members. You guys can come, and we can just, we'll just see where it takes us. Uh, so it, it's a look forward to that. So if you'd like to be part of that, you can sign up, and uh, you'll get the invite. It'll be, you'll get a notification, just the members. Um, it'll only be available to you guys. We'll do that. I'm, I, I, I was, it was on my heart when I walked out here. I thought, well, that's what we'll do. Thank you, Standard Land. For, thank you for supporting us here. We have a super chat from Mr. Troy Pichel and double Loctite member. Shout out to you. Hope to see you tomorrow. Uh, he says, got Gramps' tool chest as he moved to a home. He is Mr. Orderly. It's kicked off in me a need to square things up. It's about stewardship, isn't it? It's about stewardship. Absolutely, it is, Troy. And it's about respect. The analogy I give is if you gave your son something, and he didn't take care of it, that would hurt you terribly. And you'd be reluctant to give him anything else. If he didn't take care of his car, didn't change the oil and ran it down, it's very disrespectful, very disrespectful. And yet, here God gives us all of these things and makes sure you know, that we, we we're provided for. And all we can do, because we're brain, brainwashed and we're con conditioned by the system, is look at them at, and see all the things that we don't have. Oh, I got a... I got a, a nice truck that runs and, and good tires. I don't have to worry about um, having something that's going to break down on me, but it's not as good as my neighbors, and therefore I hate or despise what's, what's been given to me. You know, that's, that, that feeling of ingratitude, it just breeds death. It breeds, it just kills you from the inside. That envy, you may not even be aware of it, but the, the envy and the, the lack of appreciation for what you have is very, very destructive to you, and you can never grow. And, and I don't even know if you can know God if that's something that you foster in you. 
you got to be appreciative for what you have. You can get to that point. And for me, it's really being in the moment. You know, I would just as I said the other day, it, 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 you, you can be in the kitchen and I was, I was trying to get uh, the baby fed and trying to get breakfast around and, and the clock was running and the live stream was coming up and I told you I was reaching for things and, and dropping them and getting, you know, just, I could feel my heart palpitating and just getting stressed out and, and like, oh, I gotta do this breakfast and I gotta clean up the dishes and all that. Stop, I stopped it, stopped it right there. To hell with a live stream. If the live stream gets pushed an hour, it's, there's nothing in life worth this. I'm, I'm, my stress level and anxiety is being pushed upon my, my daughter. Uh, the whole experience is being terrible. I stopped it in its tracks. You know, that's, that's, and I slowed it down. I started appreciating what I had. Started appreciating that I had, had food in the house and I had orange juice to drink and that my daughter and I got to sit and have breakfast. It was all just a change of attitude. And that's what we have to do. We're not very removed. You know, those of you who, there's a lot of folks that make comments of comments yesterday that said, you know, I'll let you know that, I, that I'm, an, I'm an atheist. I don't, I don't subscribe to any of the, the stuff that you're talking about. And they've done it in a very respectful manner, which I, rep I appreciate. But I have to tell you, there's value in what I'm hearing. There's value in what you're saying. This resonates with me. And you know, a man like that is willing to come out and say that and, and not physically attack me or say something sn sn snarky or, or, or snide is very close to God and closer to God than the majority of Christians. You know, there's just a way that seems right to a man. There's just something that's inherent to us. We understand the difference between right and wrong. You know, God tells us there's, there's all, a lot of people that have concerns. They look at the Bible with a very small minds, and they think that, you know, anyone who's not just subscribing to exactly what's here is, is lost, and they have no chance. That's not true. There are people that have never had the opportunity to even see it. And if I thought for a moment that, that my father would punish someone for something that they had no control over because they didn't have access to a certain book, that's ridiculous if you think about it. And when I got in and started studying, I found out what the truth is. And the truth is, God says, I write my, I've written my law upon your heart. There's something instinctive that we all know that's right, the difference between right and wrong. If you look out across all civilizations, and it could be the American Indians, it could be Eskimos, there's just some common things that are understood. You don't just randomly murder people. You just don't go, you just can't go take any woman you want. You know, there are similarities, there, there's common grounds. That's the law of God that's been written on our hearts. It, it's the difference, it's the yin and yang, it's the good and evil. It's something that we inherently understand. And your salvation and their salvation or, or what, how you will ultimately end up in the next life is going to be determined on how you respond to this, how you respond to that still small voice. If you go against it or you go, if you go against what you know is right or you start justifying it or you just react to it. We've been talking about, I was talking about a couple days ago, the importance of this. I've really started to understand that we think too much. Thinking and lo being logical and reasoning and trying to rationalize things, that is using the wrong part of your brain. That, that is not, that does not come from God. That, that comes from us. That's our own arrogance and our own selfishness, trying to justify what we want to do and, and to soothe our conscience out of just pure logic. We need to respond. The way that God is moving upon me and, and get the insight that he's given me is the emotions, the feeling. You can feel things. Feelings translate to thoughts, and those thoughts need to translate immediate to actions. That's the way, it, the way it's got to be. And anyone in cultures, I don't care if you're a Tibetan monk or you're on the plains a Native American that never heard of, of Christ, never, never saw a Bible, how you responded to that inner voice that you knew the difference between right and wrong will determine your destiny with God. It's as simple as that. It's just nothing more to it than that. We have the lizard brain. Yeah, but thank you, Troy. And what a blessing it is to have those things. Those things are a touchstone to where, you came, where you've come from. The powers that be, the adversary and his confederates, have tried to erase our history. It's tried to, to, to eliminate 
from our memories and from our, to where we came from and who we are. A man that stands, could, that doesn't know where he came from, doesn't, you know, doesn't stand for anything and is easily swayed. Just to and fro, you know, I, I'm not really connected to this place. I have no allegiance to this area. I have no allegiance to these people because I've just moved around all the time and I'm a little bit here, a little bit there. And, and anything, you'll just be blown around. You just, you don't have an anchor. You don't have anything, any roots whatsoever. There's those connections to the past. Um, when I'm working with my granddad's tools, when I'm working with my dad's tools, I have them all around me. It's rarely a day, there's never a day where I don't have my hand on something that didn't belong to or doesn't stimulate a memory of my grandfather. And when I remember, when I touch that and I remember that, I remember his personal character and I remember the stories and where we came from and, the, and how he taught me the lessons between right, right and wrong and how much I wanted to be like him. They're a touchstone of the past and they, were, they, they, keep, me, they, they, keep, me, they keep me from being blown away by the latest or greatest thing. They are, they're important to have. I, I, I'm not putting religious connotations or religious um, significance on these items. So we're not, I'm not talking about having idols that we're praying to, you know, from our ancestors in the past. But what it does is it keeps you reminded who you are, where you came from, and the type of person that you want to be. They're important to have. They are. We have a super chat, but thank you. Uh, oh, goodness, I got to back up here. Thank you to... Um, Oh, man, I need a producer. Someday, someday we'll have a producer. <laughs> we have a super chat from Standard Land and Double Alternator member. Shout out to you. Audience asked to start the stove. Oh, thank you for the reminder. I, I told you, guys, I got the stove started. Let's throw some wood on there, too. Let's see. Let me, let me chop a couple pieces here. We'll jump in. That's not, that's not going to work, is it? <laughs> that's, too, that's too small. I got my little. This guy's pretty good. Oh. oh, that's some nice straight grain there. I, I should probably save that for kindling, but uh, we're committed now. It's not that straight. <laughs> yeah, we, we could use a little heat in here. I completely forgot about my fire. feeling good you see the single the single sterling it uh, it chooches a little better than the than the double it starts earlier less drag or something all right give me a reminder in about 10 minutes here and we'll uh, we'll get him going too all right where were we here we have a super chat from Brian M. Shout out to you, Brian, and single Loctite member. Brian says, I just realized with this live stream format, I can take a different seat in my office, close my eyes, put my feet up, and just listen. I don't have to do anything more. That's the way I do, do it, too. You don't have to look at my uh, aging, old, ugly face. Uh, you can just listen to my golden voice <laughs> anywhere you want to. And that's what I do, too. When I'm working out here, uh, I'll do it this, this afternoon. I'm work, i got to get my snow bikes packed up, I've got everything over there and ready to go. Um, I'll put on my li the live streams and I enjoy that and listen to those. But thank you, well, thank you, Brian. I sure appreciate that and um, thank you for your generosity. We have a super chat uh, from I stand against Ukraine and it's Nazi, <laughs> yeah, isn't that the truth? What a bunch of BS, huh? Unbelievable, I, there's, well, we're not gonna get into that. We all know, well, there's a few of us that know the truth, who, who the enemies really are including World War II. We have a super chat, but thank you very much uh, for that. Uh, we have a, um, I didn't even read it. He writes, my dad worked hard and long hours as a scientist, but spent weekends together wrenching on Mopars. I understand and appreciate it all now at 33. I'm gonna share with you guys, I'll share with you guys on the live stream uh, tomorrow, the member stream. Let's probably figure maybe around 10 o'clock. That could change, but I think it'll be around 10 o'clock. I got, uh, I found that my sister brought over pictures of my first car and it was a Mopar. You won't guess what it, I'll bet you won't guess what it was. Well, I'll share that with you tomorrow. I, got, I set those aside. They're, they're kind of fun to look at. But thank you for your generosity. Yeah. 
Yeah, dad, you know, dads, it's, it's hard. It's been, it's been hard on men. This, um, it, I was watching a, I was watching a TikTok video just a couple days ago, and there was a guy, just a good, you could just tell he was a good dude. I think he was 40, 42, 42 or so. He had two or three kids. He lived in the UK, and he worked at an Amazon warehouse. And he just posted this video on his phone, like he'd just gotten home from work, about how tired he was of the rat race and, and how he was rethinking his entire life. It's like, my kids are... 12, 13 now, I, I, I never see them. My, the job is never satisfied. They work me to death, I'm so tired. He stacked boxes all day, worked at the warehouse, stacked boxes all day. And he talked about having to be there for his kids in the morning and his, and his wife you know, t taking care of there and doing the things that a, that a husband and a, and a father needs to do. Then going and putting in 10 hour days of hard work, packing boxes and tearing his body up and then getting home and then all of the needs of the family upon him and being there for them, even though he's just so, he, as he said, I'm just absolutely knackered. I'm knackered, but I understand I've just got to do it. And so I do it. I do it. And he just talked about how it's killing him and how he just doesn't want to do it anymore, just can't do it anymore, and how he needed to find a way to replace that income by doing his own thing and getting his family involved. And it was one of the most heartbreaking and wretched things I'd ever seen, this good man that's just going off of instinct, going off, off the, the, what, how God made us to do as providers and protectors of our family and how that instinct is being manipulated and monetized by these evil companies. And to see that man's awakening and realize you know, that this is not sustainable, that I can't do it, was not, it was sad, but, the whole, but it was also encouraging at the time that he's at least waking, this, waking up at this. Like my grandfather and my dad, you know, they never came to that realization. They just, they, they just, it took them right, right into the grave. Their bodies were used up. Their time was used up. Before they know it, knew it, they woke up. Their kids were grown and they never knew it. I didn't really know who my dad was. He worked all the time and, and I don't blame him for that. He was, my mom was a stay-at-home mom and he was running a construction company and that's all he knew. That's what his dad did, and his dad before him, that's all they knew. And there wasn't importance, there wasn't an importance, or he thought that the best thing that he could do for his family was just provide. And you know, us, us now as fathers and, and the priests of our homes, we have a lot more important things to do than just that. We have taken on a burden that God never intended us to take on. We don't claim the promises of God. We don't put the emphasis where it needs to be. The emphasis needs to be on relationships, with you, taking, it, spending time with your kids, spending time with your wife, being there, having those things. And it's God's responsibility to provide for us what we need. Maybe we had a skewed understanding of what we really needed, how big of a house we needed, how many cars we needed. And we sacrificed on the altar of capitalism our wives and families and marriages for the great and almighty dollar. I'm speaking to myself here. I fell, cap I, I, fell, I fell into this as well. I'm just now starting to understand the folly and the error of that. I didn't trust God. I took upon His responsibility and my responsibility, and it's more than a person can do. It's just impossible, and now we see that. God didn't ask us to have all these things. God didn't ask us to live in these massive houses. What my grandfather was able to live in and raise his family in was a small little 800 square foot house and they had one car. And my grandmother, if they went, wanted to go to the store, they walked to the store. You know, and communities were designed better that way. But we have been bamboozled. And if, for us to sit here now in, in the Great Reset, as things are starting to unravel and think of all, you know, start and be depressed and blackpilled because we think of all the things that we've lost, we haven't lost anything. We simply are making a correction. We've been going the wrong way. And to continue to try to go down that way, it only gets us further from our destination. The best thing we can do and the most progressive thing that we can do is to do a 180 and turn around and come back. And that's what we're doing. That's what we're realizing. We, can, we are going to, in the future, myself included, are going to find that less is more and having more time and less possessions and a smaller house and fewer obligations are going to give us a peace and a joy that we've never even thought was possible. 
That's what God is leading us to. So don't look at the decline and having less and less options as being something that is, is negative. Mama, you have to get up here. We have a show to run here. It is, um, it's, the, it's the path to happiness. And very few people are going to be able to see that. Everyone's going to fight tooth and nail, or most people are going to fight tooth and nail to get back that broken system that we had, and that was never the way God intended us to, to never the way God intended us to live. And when we think back, when I think back of the struggle with God in prayer and the tears and the crying, oh, you know, and the worrying about money and all this stuff, and not realizing the whole time that it was those very things that were pulling us away and, and draw, building a, a huge gap, a gulf between us and our Creator. He's pulling us back. Life is about simpler things. Life is about relationships, taking care of one another, community, and not about all of these possessions. And uh, it's a trap. I fell into it. You fell into it. But we've got it figured out now. And uh, the next half, the next half of our life, I don't care if you're 40, 50, 60, 70, however many years you have left, are going to be the good ones. That's when we're going to be really making memories and, and doing that's where happiness is going to be. We're, we're on the path to happiness. I'm ranting. We have a, uh, oh, goodness, man, I, whoa, we have a super chat from, uh, oh, I got, <laughs> we have a super chat from 30 Day Review. Shout out to you, 30 Day Review, who writes, when sharpening an axe, hatchet, what's your favorite way to hold it uh, when you use a file? Also, uh, sent, I just sent in my app for editor. Okay, good. It depends. So if it's, a, if it's an axe, if we're going to take a big one, let me grab one here, I'll demonstrate. If it's anything that's like axe size or boy's axe or smaller, you bring the sharpening instrument to the tool. So what I'll do is I'll lay it on a flat plane and I make some little wedges, like, you would, like a little door stop. You should have a couple of those in your toolbox. Make a couple wedges on a miter saw and you'll use them all the time. And just lift that thing up and just stick a couple underneath there and just prop that up. Kind of get the angle you want so that it's sitting flat. And then bring your file or your stone to it. Now, if it's something smaller, then just the opposite. If it's small, a small hatchet, anything like a small forest axe, even a larger medium-sized forest axe, then I'll hold it, I'll hold it here and, and, and in my, do it in my hand. That seems to be the best way. I have a little bit more control. Or even, you know, even the small axes, you can even, if you have a small, a, a larger bench stone, you can do it this way. But you put it on a bench. Put it, you can even put a clamp on it if you have to do some heavy filing. Put a clamp on it. Put those wedges underneath there to get it up off the, off the, the table so you have a little bit of gap right there. And, and then go at it that way and flip it over. It just takes practice. You know, I... It's a really aggravating thing to, to do when you try to start sharpening something and you f you're, when you're done after 15 minutes of work that's worse than when you started. And that was my experience for a, long, for a long time. You just have to learn to do it. You, you just have to just keep doing it, keep doing it, and then you just get a feel for it. You can feel the drag of the stone. You can feel the drag of the file. You just know instinctively and you, just, you can just kind of do it second nature without even thinking. Just, just takes practice. Just keep doing it and you'll get it. I've got a lot of videos on that too. I, I, lots and lots of videos. We have a super chat. Goodness, a very generous super chat, chat from Skylar Pierce. Shout out to you, Skylar. $100. Goodness, that is very, very generous of you, and we greatly appreciate that. Skylar writes, use this for his glory. I really look up to you and am encouraged by you in this time of growing in my life, learning to die daily to myself. Any tips on that? It is a daily struggle. This morning, so here's my, I'll give you my routine, what I've been doing this week. And I have, in the past, I've really struggled with staying focused in my prayer time. It's important to do it in the morning, I think. You need to set yourself, you need to give yourself a little time, maybe even a half hour. If you could give yourself a half hour to 40 minutes or so and go through this regiment, this has been working really well for me. I've never had such focus and concentration on my time my prayer time as I have this last week. So what I do is lock the bedroom door so that you're not going to be interrupted. If you've got family and such around, just you might have to get up earlier. You might have to get up at four or before work, whatever you got to do. And what I do is I just start preparing my mind. 
start preparing my mind. And I lay out my clothing. I'm in, I'm in the moment. And uh, the first thing I do is jump into, I, I, you do the cold shower. Do the Wim Hof, Wim Hof breathing method, the cold shower, the Wim Hof breathing, breathing me- method right there. You can do that in 15 minutes. Then I'm in a state of mind where I'm very relaxed. I feel like I've really accomplished things. I feel very much alive. I, my whole system was absolutely shocked by jump, jump, jumping in that cold water. I was removed from all my depression, my grogginess, my tiredness. And then I immediately go right into prayer time right, right there. And man, what a focus um, and the ability to really convey what's on my heart and what's on my mind. And just, I just remember, I'm, not, I'm no longer praying for things. I don't trust myself to ask the right questions. I trust God in His promise that He knows what I have need of before I even ask. And I would rather have what He wants for me than what I want for me. I've always prayed for and, and tried to strive for the things that I thought would make me happy, that I wanted, that would give me contentment and peace and joy, and it's done just the opposite. So I'm not a smart man, but I'm smart enough to realize that if you've been doing something for 40, 30, 40 years and it's not working, then it's not going to work ever. So my prayer is very different now in that I go through the things I'm grateful for or anything that's troubling me, obviously, but I just, I'm just asking to make me, put, put me in alignment with you today. Strip away the things, the passions and desires and the things that I might want or even ask for that, I, that won't be good for me. And when you stop doing that, then you don't set yourself up for near as much disappointment. You may think that, oh, if I could just have this one prayer answered, my problems would be solved. What you don't see and what, what your father sees is that, if that were to be given to you, or if you were to be that prayer answered, that that would lead you away from him, or that would lead you into a place that would ultimately destroy you, or you'd be lost, and he's not willing to do that. And if we constantly you know, think that we know what we want, then we set ourselves up for disappointment. My prayer is very different now. I, I, I'm just asking. I'm repenting for anything that I've done, but I'm not dwelling on it. If I've brought that to the Lord for something that I did or someone I mistreated, I've dealt with that yesterday, I'm not revisiting that. He says, that's an offense to him. He says, you confess these things, and I I don't remember them anymore. Actually, he gives the analogy of casting them into the depths of the sea. Now, if if, if God ever wants to find your sins again, you know, he can find them because you'll be packing them around, but he's not packing them around. So deal with that straight off the bat. Once you understand that, then you can come to him with a lot less, a lot clearer conscience. You know that you dealt with that, but there'll be things that you need to discuss and you, you need to talk, talk to him about. And you'll need to, and if you don't, if you're just troubled and you don't, you know, something's off or I'm not really sure if I made the right decision, have him show you. Say, can you bring to my mind's eye anything in my home or anything in my life or anything that I've been doing or said yesterday that is an offense to you? And he'll bring those things to your mind. Confess them immediately. Deal with it. And it's done. <coughs> Excuse me. Gross. So once you have that out of the way, my focus and my concentration is bring my way of thinking, my mindset, everything, my, the way I think, the way I act, into alignment with you. You. Let me stop rebelling and fighting against you and having a struggle against you, but let us be of the same mind. And that's the way I pray, and that's the way I've prayed this week, and it's wonderful. Uh, it is more genuine, and it seems to be the better way for me. I, I would recommend that. The cold shower is important, but thank you very much, Skylar. That is very, very generous of you. Goodness. We have a super chat, another super chat from our friend Spartan219. Shout out to you, Spartan, and he writes... I appreciate you immensely. Uh, you've become a pseudo dad for me. I lost mine at 14 when he dropped his rifle. If there were one singular piece of advice you would give men like me, uh, what would it be? Man, that's tough. That's about the worst age you could lose your dad at at 14. That's when you really, really, really need him the most. Very, very tough. If you, just as a side note, just remember, God has told us in his word that I will be a father to the fatherless. And this is a prayer. You know, some of my deepest regrets in life, and even though I've you know, confessed these things and dealt with these things of my son, they were just what I was talking about, of all the missed opportunities at times where I felt like I needed to get work done, 
rather than spend time educating him or involving him with it. And one prayer that I've had uh, that I, I still recite is, is that promise. God's, God told us that he'll be a father to the fatherless. And I just ask him, you know, of all those times or in the future times when I fall down, when I fail in my responsibilities as, as a godly father and, and, and priest of my household, I, I'm grateful that you stepped in and you, you were a father and you compensated for me. You were a father to the fatherless. And, and God will do that for if you've lost a father or if you were born to a single mother. He will compensate, uh, but you have to ask for it. Um, but the advice that I would give you to, is simple, is follow the golden rule in everything. In every decision, in every word, if anyone ever compels you to help or to do some, something, follow the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you or carry one another's burdens. That, that is the thing. You, your esteem, your reputation among God and among men will skyrocket and increase if you follow that tenet because that's going to separate you from everyone else. And to add on to that, if, if a man asks you, you know, Christ talked about this, if, if an, a man asks you to go a mile with him, go two. If he asks for your tunic, give him your coat also. That is, you'll make a friend for life. Uh, and, and that will serve you in, in ways that you can't see. Sometimes you just want to take the easy route out or you justify it away. That's why it's so important to react to that initial feeling when you hear it. Normally, if you are a kind-hearted uh, uh, man and with a soft heart and generous as most men are, most men are just beautiful people, very generous with their time, very generous with, the, with their, their materials. When someone asks us for something, almost always our, our immediate response is, well, of course I'll do that. You know, they say the road is paved with good intentions because when you, are, when you receive that request, you think to yourself when someone says, hey, do you think you could help me uh, move, um, we got we to gotta move some boxes or something heavy next, next weekend, uh, could you do that? What's your initial response? Yeah, of course, brother, I'll, I'll be there. No problem, I'll be there. Well, when Saturday rolls up and you're in your slippers and comfortable on, you know, a couple hours before that, you start thinking what? You start rationalizing that way. That, that initial instinct, that emotion that turned to thought, that turned to reaction by you speaking, of course I'll come and help you, that's the right answer. That's the way we need to respond. We need to respond immediately and that's what we need to do. When you start thinking about it, oh you know what, you know, I have been working pretty hard and you know my, my wife asked me to do this and I don't really have time, then you get on there and oftentimes you're too cowardly to call him and you said a text, oh you know, making my excuses, making my excuses. That is one of the wicked, most wicked things you can do. And Christ warns us about that. He gives an analogy of a man that's very excited about something. He's going to throw a great feast. And he tells to his uh, servants and all of the guys who work for him, hey, go out to my friends uh, and invite them. I, I've, uh, slot, I, I've, uh, sl I'm going to slaughter the fatted cow. Um, I'm going to bring out the best wine. I'm going to bring the musicians. I'm going to put on a great party. I want to celebrate with my friends. They go out to all of his buddies, and his buddies start making excuses. Oh, make, my, uh, make an excuse for me. You know, I just bought a new, a new place. I got to go check it out. And, you know, hey, you know, I just got a new tractor. You know, I'd like to go out and, and try it out and see what's going on. Oh, you know, the, you know, and they don't come, and they report back to the man. And they say, he says, well, you know, he, you know, he's just dumbfounded. He says, well, okay, then if they don't want it, then, you know, go out to other people. Leaving them out, you know. That, that's an analogy that God has comes to us. I've had this table set for you. I have this wonderful life for you. And yet here we make excuses for it while we can't do it. We can't do it, can't do it. He'll get to the point where he'll cut you off and you'll, you'll lose that invitation. He'll go out to others. You know, there's a, lot of, there, there's a lot of importance to a man keeping his word. And it's very, very important that when you commit to do something like that and you react to it instinctively, do not let the thinking and the justification and the lizard brain, the logical brain, rationalize away what, and give you excuses why you shouldn't do the thing you know to be right. That would be the advice that I would give you. We've all done it, haven't we? Shame, it's shameful. It's hateful to God. 
Thank you, Spartan219. You've been very generous, very generous. We have a new member, Sasha. Welcome. Shout out to you. Another new member, Cheesecake Glasser. New member, shout out to you. Well, you'll be joining us tomorrow for the members only live stream. We'll, 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 I'll just commit it now. We'll just do it at 10 o'clock. I'm hoping that I don't have a conflict, but I don't think so. 10 o'clock tomorrow, be here, members only live stream. We'll do it in the house by the fire. We have a super chat from Diaconosis Diaconus, who writes, how can I make this message of self-employment, simple living, more family time, make sense to my family who only cares about the struggle for money? Oh, how would I go about that? That's a frustrating thing. And you can... I have a tendency in a situation like that when I, let's say that I've discovered a new truth. Let's say I've been going down the wrong path. This happens to me with Mrs. W. Mrs. W is a more even keeled person than I am. And I am hot and cold, I'll, I'll, very erratic. I'll come to a new understanding of something or, or something that I'm just absolutely convinced is, is the way to go. And now I just expect everyone to fall in line and, um, and uh, in lockstep with me. And if, I don't, if they don't do it or they don't see it the way that I see it, then I get my feelings hurt and I pout. Let's be honest here. I'm a petulant child. I'm an emotional person. And when I'm not connected to God, this is the default position and this is my nature. It's probably, not probably, those situations are, are my fault. I have to understand that my family, especially if you're a man, if you're dealing with women, they don't see things the same way that I do. Mrs. W will ultimately always come around to my way of thinking, but it takes her some time. She needs to cogitate on it. She needs to think about it. So you need to be patient with them. And you need to also walk the walk. Whatever it is that you're doing, um, you need to demonstrate it before you need to tell them what to do. Actions speak louder than words. That's true. That's the reason why it's, it's the tired old mantra. We say it over again, but it's true. It's actions speak louder than words. And then if you're like me, you have probably made mistakes in the past where you got really, really excited about things and you were convinced in your mind 1,000% that this was the right way to go and you jumped in with both feet only to for that passion to wane, you know, a few months or years later and not really follow through on things. Now, our children and our wives are watching these things. So we, we, we're our own worst enemies because of our double-mindedness and the fact that we haven't followed through and haven't been consistent with our lives. We have to overcome that. You know, the interesting story was, is with King David. King David lost his authority with his family when he committed adultery with Bathsheba. And it's really sad when he, you know, he started out, he was so close to God. God even said he was a man after my own heart and, and could do no wrong. When he committed that sin with that woman and his whole family saw what he had done, he lost all authority with his family. He could never again go and correct his son, Absalom, or, or any of his daughters or anything if they fell into any sort of a sexual sin. You could, he, he had lost, he'd given away his authority. Because they could point to him and say, who are you to tell me when you, the king, did this in front of everywhere and, and disgraced our family, disgraced yourself, and now you want to come and lecture me? He lost it. He'd given it away. We don't understand how important what we do and how we conduct ourselves to our family. We don't understand how important that is and how if we have fallen short on those things, we have not followed through we lose credibility and we've lost, we lose a lot of respect. Hi, you got one, one for me? How many, how many days? Good. How many days you got left? Uh, well, uh, 70 now. 70 now. 70 working days. Well, you're on my live stream. Oh, okay. <laughs> Do I need to sign for that? Yeah. Must be something good. More, something international. Perfect. Oh, right, great. Thank you, thank you so much. So, so the, the advice, what I'm trying to get at here is, and I don't know if this is the right answer. I got to go back here. I'm trying to remember the question here. How do you get your family on board? 
fan. I'm working, I'm working. Oh my, my goodness, I, I need a producer. I, I got some good men that, are, that are, have stepped up are gonna help me. We're gonna get this sorted out here. Um, sorry, sorry, sorry. So, you know, the hardest job in the world is, is live streaming. <laughs> uh, here we go, I'm sorry, diakonos. Di to, to wrap it all up, a very long-winded answer is, is be patient with your family and lead by example. Lead by example. Start putting maybe less emphasis in your personal life about work and, and putting more emphasis on them. Let them see the change in character. Let them see Christ, the indwelling of Christ's spirit coming and, and changing you and, you and changing your priorities towards them and they will come around and they'll fall in line. But I, I get it. I have the same frustration. I want everyone to, 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 to see it so clearly and quickly as I do. And, and that's just not, we're not all made the same. And, and it's, that's the fight family dynamic. So be patient with them, pray for them, lead by example. And nine times out of 10, they'll, they'll fall in line and come, come around with you, your way of thinking. That's the best advice I could give you. Okay, goodness. We have a, uh, let me get caught, caught up here. That was a, that's a good question, though. That's, that's something that I've struggled with. Switch and me, Super Chat, I did that for you. Thank you for the reminder. I, I did not, I can't keep track of everything. We have a Super Chat from Caddy Wampus. Good to see you back. Caddy Wampus, shout out to you. Caddy Wampus writes, Super Chatted you a while back about our move to Florida and your, and your videos making us miss the Pacific Northwest. I get that. We've decided to love back, um, ex Christmas on the, in the tropics, no thanks. Oh, are you moving back? Decided to, um, you said love back, but move back. Yeah, I, I get that. I, I, I lived in Florida, I spent a year in Florida. I lived on Sanibel Island and yeah, I, a Pacific Northwest man cannot live uh, in, in South Florida or Florida at all, maybe for a little while, but the calling of of the mountains, of just the, even just leaving, leaving Oregon on an airplane to fly somewhere, the moment that I, that that plane touches down and that, uh, that you open up to the jetway and that, that familiar, perfect humidity and temperature and the smells of the river and the smells of the, of the fir forest, they, they speak to the, they speak, they're the, it's the land of, it's my land. It, it's my environment. It's where I grew up and it's what, it's, it's where I must live. And I enjoy visiting other places, but I could never move away. I could never, I could never live it, live anywhere else. You know, I, if God calls me to do something else, of course, I'll follow that. But my heart will always be here. I, I could never be comfortable in any, any other place. There's nothing, there's nothing in the world that is satisfying, is comforting to me as just standing in the, in the giant old growth forest of the dug fir trees right there. It's, the, it's medicine. It's medicine to the Oregon man. But I get it. Uh, have a safe trip back. Yep. We have a super chat. Uh, from thank you Caddy Wampus for your generosity. We have a super chat from why are you barefoot in your videos? I love your content. You know, I was for for some reason I was known by my family and my sister used to make fun of me. She called me the tenderfoot. Now we have native we come from Native American on my grandmother's on my grandfather's side, on his my grandmother's side. And so you know we always have the the American Indian thing going on. Uh, but t I was known as Tenderfoot because you would not see me walking around barefoot at all. You know my, my affinity for boots and shoes and all that. You know, the bigger, the heavier, the better. I just felt, a, a, I felt so compelled to get my feet on, on, to have my feet on the ground, in the dirt. When I, I was out, when I did all the irrigation, maybe you saw in videos l last summer, I did it all barefoot. I was in barefoot in the dirt, barefoot in the ground, barefoot. It was tough at first because my feet were so soft and I'd hobble around. I actually had to carry my tactical clogs around and, and I had to work myself into it. By the end of the summer, I was all barefoot all the time. I've got a, I've got a rind on the, on the bottom, a callus on the bottom of my feet. Uh, I can pretty much withstand anything. I don't even wince when I step on rocks anymore. 
I just had to do it. I, I can't explain it. It's like being thirsty or being hungry. It's, it's not something you ask for. It's just something that comes upon you that you need to satiate. You just need to fix it. And I don't know if it, this was something from God or something that I needed to, you know, to be more connected or whatever, but it's just it's part of a journey of, of pulling me out of Babylon and getting back to things that are important. And that physical connection is somehow tied in with the spiritual connection. You know, is it grounding? Is it because we're exposed to so many, so many more frequencies and RF waves and all of the Bluetooth and all this stuff? Is, is it? A, I, I don't know. But I have to react to it. Your body will tell you what you need, uh, and you just have to respond to it. You, again, I'm not trying to overthink things. I'm at the point now that I'm becoming very reactionary. I'm trusting my emotions. I'm trying to stay in the moment and being aware of my situation. And when I feel something, those feelings are turning into thoughts. And those thoughts, as soon as they come into my mind, I react to them. And so I was told to take my shoes off. I felt like I needed to take my shoes off, and that's what I did. I um, got rid of my office. Uh, my, I called it my editing suite. You know, I had, everything was super nice and the latest, greatest, and I'd go in there and do all my editing, and I would try to, I kind of had it set up like a Hollywood studio would, you know, and everything was just as nice as it could be. And, and I just felt I didn't want to do that anymore. Gave my office um, to Mrs. W, uh, got a laptop, and last summer, most of my videos, a lot of them were down by the creek with my feet in the water or digging my feet in the dirt, just being connected, being outside, being around trees, being out of the office, being out of carpet and all those things. I just felt compelled to do it. And I just responded. And, and I didn't know why. And I don't know that I completely know why now, but my body needed it. God wanted me to do it. And, that's, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to be very reactionary. So I don't know. I wish I could give you a better answer. But the, it, it's got to be obvious, you know, just the, the change, just from what you guys see, just the, the change of, of having a purpose and being excited and just the way that I speak. And you can tell you can't fake enthusiasm. You can't fake happiness and, and excitement and joy. And that's what I have right now. And I, a lot of it is attributed to what really pushed me over the edge was the, the cold shower. The cold shower and the Wim Hof breathing thing. I'm only six days in it, but it is, I, I can see that as being a lifestyle. I thought, I was thinking this morning, you know, we talked about Mrs. W and I's dream. If you're just joining us, you may not know, but Mrs. W and I's dream, we want to do is have this to be a facility for, for people that can come. Couples can come and we can do things together. We can have that experience that we've so enjoyed from Clinton Heidi uh, at Thunder Ranch. I think that those two have it figured out. And, and I thought, how interesting, wouldn't it be something, it, it just dawned on me this morning, I've wanted to, I was, uh, I was going to go and talk, I got a buddy that is kind of a stonemason down the road, and he's done some work for us, and I was going to ask him if he could get me some big stones that we could take down and, and just sit on the ground there and just kind of stack up and make a little bit of kind of a little step down so we could step down into the water, the river. We have, the north of us is, is a very, very cold, it's full of ice right now, very, very cold river, and there's a deep pool right Right there, right there on our property. It's, we have a half a mile of a riverfront. I would never have considered even dipping my toe in there. It is so cold, so cold. Glacier fed, comes right down off of Fuji, melted ice, absolutely the cold, 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 cold. But the cold shower is so invigorating and the benefits that I've been receiving from it are so incredible. I thought, well, if that's good, then how much better can we make it? I'm actually considering having a daily routine where I go down there, I'm going to jump in there and, and just be in that water for as long as I can take. You know, maybe I start with a minute, I'll do what I can, but instead of the shower, go down there and do that. 12 months a year, whatever, every single day. Just make that the way that I start my, my deal. And I thought, I just had this vision in my mind, like, wouldn't that be something if this was God's plan all along? How many people have a river, you know, access to a river that you can go jump in, you know, pristine mountain river like that? Uh, that uh, if folks that wanted to participate that and, and come, uh, they're you know learning these new truths like I am, that we'd all be down there splashing around. You know, we could have have 
keep the men and the women separate. You know, modesty is important. Those traditional things, those lines, some of those lines shouldn't be crossed. And we could do a little with getting back to the way things were done by our grandfathers, right? Um, so keep things modest as possible. The men will go down and have their time if they want to participate and do it. I'll be doing it. If you want to join me, it'll be an option for you. And then the women could go down. You know, if Mrs. W, if she <laughs> decides to do this, you know, she can lead that or whoever. We'll figure it out. Uh, but I, I just saw that in my mind and I thought, let's make that a reality. Let's make that happen. Let's make that an option for us. Um, it, I, my sister and I had a most wonderful it was the last night we had to spend together before she, she left this morning at 6 a.m. and to back to California. And we just had the most wonderful time together. Um, a lot of these things I'm talking about and these realizations, it was funny, a week ago, she just sent me a random picture, a, a little short video, texted me of her going down, um, her and her partner going down into the water, co the cold Columbia River, uh, and that's what they do. She's been doing this before I even started. I didn't even know. She didn't even tell me. I've never, haven't even communicated to it. It just so happened that both of us are, we, we're very, di we've been very different and had a lot of hard, a lot of hard times getting along. I, I've, I've been a real right wing person. That's the way I was right, raised with my dad. She's been a lot more connected. She's always been barefoot. I always mocked her and made fun of her. Why don't you put some shoes on? You know, she's in her garden with a shovel with flip-flops and bare feet. She's been closer to the truth than I have, and it's always been that way. I would have been a lot better suited to pay attention to what she was doing and emulating her rather than vice versa. She's always been, she's just a thought leader. She's just ahead of her time and has been more connected. And I think, and I don't think she'll mind me sharing this. I'm not going to go into details, but when she was little, she had a near-death experience. And for some reason, folks that have been through near-death experiences have a, an insight and a connection to God that the, the rest of us just can't seem to attain. It, it's, they've seen something that we haven't seen, and it affects their lives entirely. And she's always been a seeker and searching. And I've always thought she was a bit crazy and out there and, and dismissed all of her her, her, everything that she said and everything, that, all her searching. Thought that I had it figured out the whole time when, when, all along, she was closer to God than I was. We had a wonderful dinner last night and for really the first time ever that I can remember, we were able to just be together without any judgments, not judging each other, listening to one another, enjoying, we, we, it, that dinner we had last night with the, bait, with, with the sweet loaf, my sister and I, is one of the most precious memories I'll ever have and I'll carry it with me forever. It's amazing how similar the conclusions that we've come to and the understandings that we've come to in the last year, how similar they're paralleled. They're almost, we're almost walking hand to hand together if not already. And I would say if there is a gulf between a still or some misunderstanding, it's, it's, more, it's more me coming into a line with the way she sees things. And she's, it's, it's so encouraging. You can think that, am I insane? Am I crazy? You know, I, I just, I feel compelled to respond to these things, whether it be the shoes or, or what have you, or, or recommitting my faith to my father. Uh, but when you see your sibling having the same experiences and just the cold water thing, both of us to coming to that realization at the same time, it was a confirmation to me that it's the right way to go. It was, it was, a, it was wonderful. Just wonderful. Thank you, Caddy Wampus. Good luck with your move. And thank you, Vision. Uh, that's the best answer I can give you. Give you. I don't know if that, if, that, if that helps. We have a super sticker from Zach Wilkerson's. For, shout out to you, Zach. Very generous of you. And new member, Adam Wallace. Adam Wallace, you'll be able to join tomorrow's live stream. It's going to be a banger. You don't want to miss it. As well as Vision Sensi. Shout out to you. We'll see you tomorrow as well. Tomorrow at 12. Be here. It's going to be the small group, the inner circle. Everyone's welcome. We have a super chat from Sean Johnson who says, can you please read my super chat from earlier? Oh, goodness, Sean. If any one of the mods, Overton, if you can pull up Sean's 
Can you give me Sean's, uh, what he wrote? I'm sorry, Sean. I will definitely read that. I don't know how, f- it, the super chats, they disappear if I don't get to them and I get to ranting and you know how it goes, but I'm, I apologize for that. Shout out to you, Sean. Um, if one of the mods can find that, I will, um, I will make you whole. We have a super chat from Cheesecake Glasser. Shout out to you, Cheesecake Glasser, who says, my name is Frank. And as a 21-year-old young man, I appreciate you and everything you've taught me. So far from watching you from the East Coast. You know, we do love our East Coast brothers. All of that uh, has been tongue-in-cheek, um, not, not to be taken serious. But there's, that's, the way, that's the way when you like someone, when men like each other, you rib each other. You give each other a hard time. If I didn't like you, I wouldn't talk about you, <laughs> right? So um, the fact that uh, you're always on my mind tells you that I admire you. There's nothing wrong with an East Coast man. He may be stubborn, but he is loyal and faithful. Shout out to you. And we have a super chat from Rambo Beaver 007 Shout out to you, Rambo. From Sweden. Hello from Sweden again. No winter here in South Sweden this year. Really crazy rain and rain and rain. Love these live streams. Keep it up. I've been hearing that a lot. You know, the last couple winters, we've gotten a lot of snow, especially last year. And there's nothing that rankles the Swede more to see other people getting snow while he's drowning in the drizzle of rain. It's depressing to a Swede. It hurts him in his soul, uh, a Nordic man not having snow. So I appreciate that. Now, I'm not a Swede myself. But being married to one, I can sympathize and commiserate. I've been to your beautiful country three times, and I love Sweden. I've been treated so well there. Uh, nothing better than in the morning to go down to the coffee shop and get a cardamom bun and to sit there, and everything's a little bit smaller. You know, that we don't, we, and everything's giant like in America. I'll tell you, one of my favorite things to, in Sweden is to go to, to grocery stores. I was... God smacked the first time I went to one of your grocery stores. Everything was so small, everything was on a smaller scale. Like uh, the quantities are not as big, but the quality is a lot better. And the packaging, it, it's just very quaint and it's, it's nice. It's, a ni- it's just so much nicer. And the food quality, it, what really stood out to me. Now, I'm not, I'm not down with all of your fermented fish and stuff. I'll tell you. I had a bad experience. Now, I was not open mind, as open-minded as I am now when I first visited Sweden for my first trip. Mrs. W, if you don't know, Mrs. W's mother is from Sweden. She came over as an au pair when she was a, a young girl, um, met my father-in-law who was in the military, and they got married and had um, Mrs. W and her twin brother. So all of her family uh, is from Stockholm and, and still live over there. So I had, until I met Mrs. W, and their family is very international, of course. You know, my, my, my brother-in-law lives in the Netherlands and is raising his family over there, and it's very, they're very comfortable with, with that part of the country. And actually, our children are going to get, and Mrs. W, are going to get dual Swedish citizenship. Um, that, or it's in the works now, so that's kind of cool. So Jack uh, would be able, if he wanted to, to go, over, go to university over there uh, for, for free uh, or I think that's how it works. So I went over there, the ugly American, and the, the family all got together. Uh, to, it was a big event. The, the Americans are coming over, and they, they thought they would do a, a traditional Swedish meal. I'm not about eating fish. I told you guys that I f- was a serious fisherman for a long time, but I never ate it. I gave it away. I, no, I don't like fish. I, I'll take halibut or cod fish and chips but that's it i don't want any salmon i don't want any trout i don't want anything with a bone or i don't want any of that i don't like it and if you ferment it then that's even tenfold worse so me being a really picky eater and a mcdonald's eater at the time i i i've got a plate and it's the swedish smorgasbord and it's a traditional meal so that means there's there's one thing that i really really detest the taste of and that's dill I don't, anything that has the hint of dill in it, I'll spit it out of my mouth. It's, it's disgusting to me. Well, they eat a lot of dill. And so I was, I had this plate and I was going through there and I'm looking at it and I'm just dying to death. I'm just thinking, oh, I'm hungry. There's nothing in here I could eat, but I, I can't be rude. So I'm taking like the smallest amounts, you know, like a little dollop of this. I don't even know what it is. And I'm trying to avoid things and finally, I see, some, I see my salvation right in the midst of it is a big old plate 
of fried fish sticks, like the fish sticks we used to have in school, you know, the Gordon's fish sticks. And there, there's a whole bunch of it. And I'm thinking, bingo, man, I'm all about that. I, I can eat that. I can eat me some fish sticks. And at least I'll cover up my plate with those things. Well, I no more than started to get a, a big old helping of those fish sticks. Some nice old woman grabbed my arm and in this, in this Swedish accent said, oh, no, those are for the children's. And, and I was deprived of my prize. It just tore the guts right out of me. I thought, oh. Made it through the line. Little tiny dollops. <laughs> I sat down. People were commenting. I don't think we were married at the time, or maybe fiance, maybe we we're married, or your husband, or whatever. He doesn't eat very much, does he? No, well, yeah. anyway, I got through it, and uh, immediately, as soon as we could get out of there, straight to the McDonald's, uh, and I was made whole. But that was my, that was my Swedish experience. <laughs> now, uh, I'm better behaved, and a little bit more well-rounded, and I understand that it's not going to kill me, and uh, don't be an ass, and just eat what's offered and put in front of you. That was, that was it. <laughs> Shout out to you, Adam, new member, Adam and Vision. We'll see you tomorrow. Oh, we're going to have to wrap it up. We have a super chat from so Sean Johnson. Oh, well, I missed your, missed your super chat. Did we ever get that pulled up? Um, Rambo Beaver, we're, we're catching up, we're catching up. Nick Chase, welcome, Nick Chase. We'll see you tomorrow as well for the members only, super members only. Goodness, we have a super chat. Another one from Andrew Roos. Shout out to you, Andrew. Thank you, Andrew, for your generosity. It does not go unnoticed. Andrew is from Australia, and I, he says, I tend to watch a lot of gun YouTubers, so I'm very jealous of you being able to have guns. But is it the grass greener? Are Americans jealous of Australian safety? We are not. Actually, I'll be completely honest. I love Australians and New Zealanders. I, I have been fond of saying this. I've never in my life met an Australian or a New Zealander that wasn't just an absolutely delightful person with a great zest for life and, and, and masculine and just infectious. I, would, I just love being around Australians. They're, they're, they're just manly, good people. But we do not envy you not having guns. Actually, we pity you. We understand. I know the history. I know what happened in the gun buyback programs with your country and stuff and how it all happened. And it may be fine now. I think that's a very short-sighted view. But there's going to come a time, if it hasn't come already, where, where you're going to wish that you had them, it seems to me anyway. Um, a, lot, a lot of what you see about American gun violence is very, well, all of it is very isolated. It's not a day-to-day -day thing that we have to live with. Now, and I am guilty of perpetuating this. Of course, I like to, I like the gun culture. I like to promote it. I like to do fun, fun videos that show me armoring up and putting all this cool stuff on for my visits to Portland. Am I afraid to go to Portland? I am not. Am I a fool in certain areas where I'm not going to protect myself? Of course, but you have to understand that a lot of this is hyperbole. A lot of this is grandstanding and showing off and an excuse to show off your cool stuff. We are men and we like to show and tell. We're, we're just children inside. So you don't really get a certain perspective. If you were to come here and spend a week with me uh, or a million other rural areas or places in the country, you wouldn't even recognize the landscape and you wouldn't even see anything or any violence like that. It just doesn't happen. It's not a day-to-day -day thing. Now, in the inner cities where this is a problem, uh, actually the most violent places that you'll hear about and come across are the places that have the strictest gun laws. And that's a proven fact. That's undeniable. So it's really not that way. It may look that way from the media, and there's a lot of people and, and, and media and governments that, that have a particular agenda and they benefit or they, they want that perspective to be out there for you guys. But if you were to come here, it's not that way. Just like there's a lot of perceptions that we have. You know, us Americans think you guys all run around with those stupid hats uh, with the corks on them and a crocodile Dundee vest. You know, a lot of people, their only understanding of Australia is what they've seen in Hollywood movies, and they think that's the way it is. They don't understand anything about Australia or its history. But um, you have to, you can never really get to know a people or a place until you visit. It's the same thing with your neighbor. You can drive by your neighbor a thousand times 
and you can see him coming and going and maybe you try to form an opinion from what he wears or where you think he works or what he drives or how he mows his lawn, but you don't have any idea of what's going on inside. You go inside, you have dinner with him, you sit down and have a nice evening and maybe have a glass of beer or play cards with, with your family's play cards together. You, you'll see, oh, I had no idea. I didn't realize this at all. Everything that I thought was correct was wrong. And that's the same thing with America. Americans and Australians are some of the best people in the world and our New Zealand friends. But no, we don't envy you. Um, we're just glad that didn't happen to us. I think most people... W w it, l l go ahead, put, put sevens in the chat if, if I'm on point with this. Uh, to my fellow Americans, would you say that everything that I just said to our Australian friend was, was on point? Um, put sevens on there if you say yes, and put uh, zeros if I'm completely off base and wrong. I think I'm right. I know I'm right. We have a new member, Nick Chase. Shout out to you, Nick. We'll see you tomorrow. And Andrew, thank you for your generosity. Yep. I love Australians. Absolutely love Australians. I want to go there. I want to go there. I, my days of, of traveling, air travel, I think are probably over. I, 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 it, it's been turned into something, just the indignities and the ridiculousness and the foolishness is more than I can stand. I don't need to subject myself. There's nothing I want to see in the old world so bad that I would subject myself to the indignities of air travel. Dom Beeps has a question about appendix carry. What's my opinion of appendix carry? It seems comfortable, but it still frightens me to the point of muzzle in that direction. I appendix carry often. Appendix carry is the best way uh, for vehicle. So if you need to get at it fast, uh, it's actually the best way. Because what happens is, <coughs> if you were to be jumped, we go into the fetal position. That puts your hands, instinctively, it puts your hands right where they need to be. That's the reason why Alaskan fishing guides, hunting guides, carry the bear, their bear guns right here on the chest. If they're, you protect your vitals, you protect yourself. If you're being attacked, that puts your hands, it gives you access to it. And if you live in a cold climate, having it on the hip or towards the back, you have to fight through clothing, you know, the old, that's just not the best way. The, the front is the best way to carry it, to, ha to have your, your firearm there. So appendix carry is good. If you are, and I hear this all the time, and I, it makes me kind of angry. Oh, I'm afraid I'm going to shoot my wang off. I would have serious concerns. If you have such a, if you don't understand the tool that you are using, if you, if you are so ignorant, and I'm not saying ignorant as, as you're stupid, ignorant I'm ignorant about a lot of things. It's just not having a complete understanding of it. It's not an insult. If you're ignorant of how your firearm functions and how it works, then you need to get that sorted out. You, you need to understand it forwards and backwards. I can assemble any one of my, from my G26 up to my G7, 19s, 19X, whatever, I can disassemble them down to the fire pin, down to the spring clip cups, blindfolded. Assemble, disassemble. I know it has how many safeties it has. I know how everything functions. I know exactly how it works. I know everything about it. It's impossible for the thing to go off. And it's stupid, unless you're completely incompetent, it's stupid to carry a, a, a firearm that's not loaded. It's stupid. It's, very, it's irresponsible. It's dangerous. You need to understand your weapon. You need to understand how it works. If you don't understand it, that's, if that scares you, then you need to, to, to figure that out. You either need to get something that's less complicated that you do understand and put the work in. If you're going to put your hand to that plow, if you're going to strap that, that, uh, that bad boy on, you have, that comes with a great responsibility, and you need to understand how your tool functions. I hate I despise that comment. I despise guys that say that. Oh, you're stupid. You're going to shoot your, day, your, your blank off, whatever. No, I'm not. I understand how it works. I, <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a silly thing to say. Go back to work. Figure it out. 
Whatever it is, if you have something that's so complex that you don't, you're worried that you're going to do something wrong, get rid of it. I, I don't think you should carry anything other than, than a Glock. Make it simple, make it work. Have it all, get rid of all that garbage, get rid of all the fancy stuff, decockers, grip safeties, get rid of all that crap. Get into the 21st century, get a Glock, understand it, know how it works, watch the videos, take it apart, assemble it, take it apart, be comfortable with it, and you, you'll put your mind at rest. I hate to be hard on you right there, but I have to. Sometimes you need to boot up the ass. But thank you, Dom. I hope you don't hate me. We have a super chat from Jared C. who writes, I'm about to head to Harbor Freight to buy an axe. Not a member yet, but I can't wait for the next live stream. Yeah, Harbor Freight, they've got they're pretty good value. Uh, I don't know about the steel, but how good does the steel need to be? It would be one thing if you were out in the in the great forest of the Pacific Northwest, you know, cutting timber for a living, you know, then you might want to look at something a little bit higher quality, but for just regular rank and file and just having something to have on hand, uh, of course. If you want something that really bridges the gap between, let's say, Grand Force Brooks and Harbor Freight, that cold steel, the cold steel trail boss, if they still make it, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's almost perfect. Do I have one here to show you? Where is my trail boss? It's never around here. All my fancy axes are here hanging on the rack and the trail boss is never at hand because I'm always using it. I'm always grabbing it because it's such a good ax. About 40, 50 bucks. I'd get one of those. You won't be, yeah, look at that. See the sevens? Look at the sevens. So from our Australian friends, th this is telling you what you need to do. Hundreds of them, look at them. Seven, 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 seven. That's the way that it is. We got, we've got one guy. We should just ban him for just being, uh, being obstinate. <laughs> but sometimes we need to have the opposite to keep us in check. That way we, you need to know what, what you believe. And when you have opposition, it forces you to uh, really drill down and, and make sure you know what your, what your core beliefs are and, and that you can argue them. All right. Someone broke into the wrong cold shower. <laughs> yeah, no one wants to break into my cold shower. It's never far from my heart the gold standard right here. Of course, I can't show it on the live stream, but the G19X is as good as it gets. Sell everything you have and buy two of them. G19X uh, is the way to go. And 12 magazines, and you are one and done. And get this holster. There is no other. Safari Land. With, with Room for the X300 Surefire. Right there, that is the business. It is pure vanilla right there. What do I think of Canada? I think Canada's kind of sad. How do I say this without offending you? I don't even want to say the first thought that came to my mind when I thought of Canada. I'm going to be nice and not saying it. Say it. Say it. The Canadians are the, some of the nicest people you'll ever meet, and very, very kind, gentle. Pe Canadians don't want to fight. They don't want trouble. They just want to be happy and get along and and uh, live their strange life. But that niceness has been exploited. Uh, by the left, and you guys have gotten a little bit too crazy uh, in some of your politics that are going to be your downfall and destructive. You, the tyranny that is upon you guys, uh, and the fact that you still lay down and, and let it happen, is it, it almost, I think it might, I think you may have reached the tipping point. I think you may have went too far and you've lost control of it. You've let foreign nationals in, you've let your politicians um, turn you into a, a a, a basically a slave, a slave state, and I don't know if you can get it back. Um, we'll see. I feel sorry for Canada. It is, um, you've, been, you've been manipulated and your good nature has been taken advantage of. We'll just, we'll just stop with that. I hope not to offend you. I have nothing against the Canadian people. I, I, I used to go up there and ski in BC, spent time up in BC and spent a lot of time around Canadians and with Canadians. Have fam we have a lot of friends that are from, from Canada. And you, are great people, a lot of creative people come from Canada. A lot of really great artists and musicians that, that I enjoy come out of Canada. But uh, 
what's happened lately with your government is, is frightening and your, how cozy you are with China is frightening. But the Canadian people I, I think very highly of. Thank you, Xavier. I hope I didn't offend you. Well, no, I don't. It just, it is what it is. We have a super chat from Don Beep. Shout out to you, Don. I'm trying to sh shut down. We're going two hours? Goodness. Thank you so much. That makes a lot of sense. Also, my 940 came in today. Uh, does anyone want to buy a pair of three? Yeah, the 940 is the superior blade to the pair of three. I didn't want it to happen. I was, um, I was, um, how's the word? I, I, I was, um, what's the word when uh, I was beguiled? I was beguiled by another woman, if we're, if we're going to use that analogy, away from my, my, my true beloved, which was the Benchmade 940, because of her, her sexy lines and her beautiful curves and her, uh, uh, that nice clicking motion and that, that sharp tip. I was, I was beguiled and I was led away, led astray for a short time, uh, but then I came to the realization of my error and now I'm back. Uh, and I'm, I'm ride or die with a 940. So you're in good company and good choice. Dom, I hope I didn't offend you, but get to know, get to know your tool. Uh, whatever it is you're carrying, get rid of it and get, it, get, get, get something with a, that starts with a G and ends with a K. You may love your M&P, Joe, but I do not. But whatever works for you. Stick with what you know. Stick with what you like. If you're familiar with it, if you're comfortable with it, then uh, you, you get after it. We have a super chat from Curtis Apgar. Shout out to you, Curtis. And Curtis writes, uh, day two of cold shower. I'm interested in this. I'm all in. Have you considered taking a break from coffee? I began that process today. Oh, goodness. I, that is a bridge that I know is, uh, that, that's something that I know is coming up. I'm starting, you know, we talk about the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, convicting you of things that you need to shed and get rid of. You understand that I'm a Pacific Northwest man, and over here, coffee is, coffee is more important than religion with a lot of people. And I, and I get that. It is a ritual that I absolutely love and I look forward to. It is the highlight of my morning. I know it's not good for me, especially at the, at the strength level that I drink it. I, I have been, I know I need, to, I need to shed it. I know I need to do. And that's going to be the next thing. Um, that when you start realizing the benefits of something, like the cold shower, like it was super hard for me to get into it because I didn't know what to expect. I thought it was a bunch of hooey, and I know how YouTube influencers are and, and how hyperbolic they are and anything to get clicks and attention and you over-exaggerate things, you know. It's just our nature. And I thought it was a lot of that. And so it was hard for me to do it. Um, but now, six days in, it's amazing. It's absolutely amazing, the effects. And now I'm starting to wonder, well, if that one thing that helped me so much, then what, how much better may my life be if I'm not dependent upon that, that vice of coffee? Because it is an addiction. It's a very strong addiction. Try to quit it if you think it's not. Um, I know it's coming. I know it's coming. You're ahead of me. But um, I, I can see that happening. But, you know, We men, a lot of you are going to be able to relate to this. Those of us who are black and white, every day we've been getting a question from, from some of you guys. Hey, how do I deal with my black and white nature? How do I deal with, you know, I'm on and off and I make decisions very quickly. That's good. That's a good characteristic to have. The men that settled the West, the men that were willing to throw all caution to the wind, pack up their family, go through the difficulties of going through the 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 Oregon Trail, up over the Rockies, you know, tremendous, tremendous hardships. I read that there was a gravestone every hundred yards on the Oregon Trail. So many people died on that, but yet there were a small group of men that were willing to do that. And us on the West Coast pride ourselves, we come from that stock. We come from that hardy stock of risk-taking, adventurous men. It's in our nature. It is the man that is willing to throw caution to the wind. That, that's the only man that ever achieves anything great. So let's not tamp that down. Let's not look at that as a negative. We just need to be able to control it. It is a fierce power that's, that can just explode and destroy your whole life. You have to be able to force it, keep it right here, but channel it and direct it to where it needs to go. So don't diminish that. 
You know, you can look at a guy, a guy can, that has that can go one of two ways. He can either do great things for good or he can do great things for terrible. The man that doesn't have that can never do anything. He's just a milk toast man. He's a fence sitter and he'll never really accomplish that much. He'll just be status quo. There's just going to be like, people like that. We're not all created equal, no matter what they told you. Some people are just better than other people. That's just the way that it is. I don't know why. We all know it. It's the truth. No one wants to admit it. If you have that tendency, you can do great things. The man that's willing to throw a million dollars on the roll of a dice is the man that can be the next one to break the world speed record in something or to do something that no man's ever done before because he's willing to put it all on the line and, and, and move humanity and move civilization up to the next notch because he's not afraid to fail. It's an incredible gift. I have it. Many of you have it. But it can also destroy you. So we have to be careful with that. It's just, it comes with age. If you can survive your youth and you're not in prison, you know, that's the sad thing about America and our prison system. We have been taught that the men in the prison system are demons and devils and, and dangerous men and, and not fit for society. What the power structure understands is that these are the men that would be the Julius Caesars. These, was, these are the men that would be the Alexander Greats. And they are, pose a very serious threat to those that run the status quo. And they have developed an organization through the U.S. police and, and uh, police forces to tamp this down to locate these men that could do great things, that could, that could deliver people, liberate people from oppression, and throw them in a cage. And the majority of those men that are locked down in there are the very ones that we need uh, to be great and extraordinary. It's a sad reality. It, 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 the society and the power structure that be, that be does not like this sort of man. They do not like men that don't need them. They don't like men that they can't control. They like men that they can control. And everything from, your, from the time you were put in school to your basic kindergarten education all through college was all about stripping you out of that and making you a drone to fit into the system to produce. They're farming you and they're getting rich off of you and you are, we're, we're doing it and have been doing it. We need to be men that can't be controlled. That is the greatest, that's, that's the only hope for this country and for our families, and there are very few of us. And unfortunately, most of them, most of the good ones are locked up. That's the way it is. It's the world we live in. How long before they come from me? Well, let them come. We have a super chat. I probably missed some. Uh, but Curtis, thank you. Yeah, good for you, man. The coffee, I'll, I'm going to start thinking in that direction. Once you start thinking in a particular direction, you move in that direction. We have a super chat from Maxwell Elfman who writes, It's my 22nd birthday, and I'm going with the boys tonight to make a donation to my local casino. Love the videos. You guys have a good time. Stay away from those, stay away from those women. I'll tell you, I'm not going to tell you what to do, but the state of Western women has gotten to the point now. What you have to understand about women is their currency is attention. That is the most important thing that they do because you know that because they spend every effort and everything, everything about them, a good majority of, not all, but a good majority of them to get attention to themselves. And if you want to make them crazy and mad, ignore them. I, like you guys in the past, used to, when I would see a woman that was wearing revealing clothing, making an exhibition of herself, um, of course, that drew my attention, right? Now, I go out of my way to ignore them. I won't look at them. I won't even acknowledge them. I make it clear to them, I'll turn my back on them. And I advise you to do the thing, the same thing. If you're going out there in that environment that's going to put you in proximity with this sort of Western woman, ignore them. Show respect to the women that de deserve respect. As I said in past videos, I no longer open doors. I no longer stop for women. I'm not helping any women at all unless she deserves it. I am married to a virtuous woman. I open the door for her. I put her first. I give her the best of everything. I treat her like an absolute queen because she is a virtuous woman and she deserves it. These women 
that are feminists and have taken on this, um, I'm strong and independent, but still want to be treated like traditional women and have the respect they think is due them, reject them. Ignore them. Don't even look at them. I don't care if they've got their whatever, their assets out, tight this and that, yoga pants, ignore them. Show disdain for them and do not buy into that. Be a man. Show some, have some balls, have some dignity, have some self-respect. Drooling and slobbering and simping over these whores, no. Stop doing it. Don't give them the satisfaction. Let, the, let them have, they don't want the simps, the simps are the only ones that pay attention to them. Let that be the only pool of men that they can draw from. And maybe then, maybe then, they'll finally stop, reflect, and make the changes they need to make. Ignore them. Do nothing for them. Do nothing for them. Do it. If more of us did that, the problem, the, why, the reason why it, it still is, it goes on, it's getting worse and worse and worse, is because the army of simps caters to them. They want attention, they're given attention, and if you ignore them. Professional homeowners, we do not give respect to whores. We have a super chat from Jamie. Good to see you back, Jamie. Jamie, you've been very generous. What spider code knife were you thinking about buying? I'm not thinking about buying one. Uh, it was the Spider Co. Para 3. I had one. I actually lost it. It was actually a good knife, but it's not as good, not as good for an all, not a good, not as good an all-around knife as the Benchmade 940, in my opinion. We have a new member, my 12521252. Not new, old member. Double lock, <laughs> double lock type member. I'm sorry. I appreciate that. Thank you for, thank you for hanging out with us. All right, we got to shut her down. Thank you, gentlemen, for watching. Thank you for our moderators. I sure do appreciate it. May God bless you and your families. Please keep us in your prayers. We are on the vanguard, the tip of the spear. Uh, we are getting the attention of the adversary, and um, we are under direct attack all the time, spiritually and, and worse, and more. So pray for us. Uh, we'll, uh, pray for me that I continue, can continue to have the courage that I need. We need. I need the courage of a lion to get through this, um, but uh, with God before me, who can be against me? Thank you for watching, gentlemen. We'll see you, members, tomorrow, 10 o'clock, and everyone else, uh, Lord willing, we'll see you Monday at noon.